Good morning, everyone. Thrilled to see everybody out and about today. We have several announcements that we need to make before we get started. First of all, the communion supplies, I'm sure all of you know where they are, but if you have need of that, they're in the back. Wednesday night, let's don't forget our study in Hebrews and our meal together, and uh, we're going to have a fun meal, I think. Ken and Vicki are bringing some ribs, so we just, the rest of us bring uh, whatever might go with ribs, some baked beans or whatever you want to. I'm not sure how this big white mustache will do with eating ribs, but I'll bet you I'm enjoying it anyway. We have a personal work program that has started that uh, the ladies are going to actually carry on. It seems to be a lot of excitement about that, so if you want to be a part of that, please contact one of us. Sick list. We need to start with Karen Turner. She is once again battling some leukemia problems, and it's manageable. You know, she's in good shape, but she does have to start some uh, treatment program again, so we need to remember her about that. Jack Corbett, of course, we all know, is scheduled for uh, April the 1st with his surgery. Be sure and remember that. Reba Schmidt is home, but would love visits or cards or something to eat, whatever. Uh, they're a couple that sure could use our assistance. Let's re continue to remember Burke and Gentry Hamblin as they have requested prayers for various needs with their health and personal. Mike McKee, the brother of Ronnie McKee, has asked for help or asked for, we need to be helping him in, in, in the way of encouragement and prayer if we can do that. Little baby Vivian Whitaker that we've talked about in the past has been in the hospital again for two weeks. Uh, with her treatment, she's troubled by temperature spikes where it goes way up. So she is back home again right now, but is struggling somewhat with her treatment. Obviously, we all know we need to be praying and praying earnestly about the situation in Ukraine. Cheryl Lively took a fall in a parking lot, and she said she actually stopped traffic. So, and that's not funny, but she is stove up. It's been kind of hard for her to get around, and we know how important she is to all of us here and to Richard and everything. So let's remember Cheryl. There are some two spring meetings in the area. First of all, from the book of James, a Bible workshop, April 7th through 9th down at Quartz Mountain. So if anybody's interested in that, this will be out in the foyer. And then a gospel meeting at Sayre, April 10th through the 13th, and the information about that. We'll have that posted out front too. So. Those two things need to be remembered. I don't think I have anything else. Is there something else that anybody has? If not, would you bow with me in prayer as we open our worship service? Almighty God, we are so grateful to be here this morning. We are humbled to be here in your presence and to get to speak to you what an awe-breaking thing that is. We want to thank you, dear Lord, for all the good things that are in our lives, for this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day, for the rain we've received, for the friendship and the love, and on and on the list of good things go that all come from your hand, and we are so grateful. We pray, dear Lord, this morning for this congregation that we worship in strength and in power and in a pleasing way to you and beneficial to your kingdom. We pray, dear Lord, for a long list of people who need your assistance and their health and otherwise, for Karen and Jack, and Danny and Louise, and Richard and Cheryl, Reba, the Hamlin brothers, for Mike and Ronnie McKee, baby Vivian, for all those in care centers around, we pray, dear Lord, that you would help them to know they are loved and missed. 
Dear God, we pray especially this morning for the situation in Europe as it deteriorates and gets worse, and it's a scary thing worldwide. We pray, dear Lord, that you would see fit for all men to come together in peace. Please bless us now as we go through this week. Please be with us in moments of temptation. We beg forgiveness of our sins. These things we pray through Christ. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus, make glad angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord. each and every one of us because he sent his son to die for us that we have the assurance of being with him in heaven and because of the grace and mercy that he gives to each of us as we are sinners we need that each and every day because we falter we ask you to be with us this morning as Ken brings this lesson, that we can take what we learned today and, and live it out in our lives and, and to spread it throughout Cordell and throughout the world. We just ask that you continue to be with the congregation here to strengthen us and, and help us to be the light of this part of the world. We just or stand in awe of what the opportunities that we have because you are our God. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
chapter of the book of Romans, and that would, in appearance at least, mean that we're about halfway through with this study. And as we begin the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, it appears that Paul is introducing us into a new subject, and indeed it is a new subject, and the only difference is that it is still placed in the same context of where we've been in chapter six and seven. Now, I'm not going to sing. Burke will put some slides up in a moment, but I, it's, uh, it's, I just want you to know it's, uh, it's, it's coming. Okay. It's the same context. We've been talking for a couple of weeks in the context of chapter 6 and 7 about when we come into the kingdom of heaven, there are all kinds of blessings. And we've, we've noted some of those blessings as Paul has noted some of those blessings. But we come into the kingdom... In warfare, we are in battle, and Satan is our enemy. And we are fighting Satan with all of our might, and the problem is the fight goes on as long as you and I are alive. Satan never stops wanting to destroy us. And that causes us to become weary in battle, or to have what I've been calling battle fatigue. And some of you probably may be, at least, feeling that even this morning. And so you have been wrestling with a certain issue. Satan is using that to attack you. And maybe it is a health issue. And we've mentioned two or three of those this morning already. Or maybe it's a relationship issue. And Satan is using that to attack you. Or maybe it's your job. Or... Maybe it's just that Satan continues to come at you with a certain kind of temptation over and over again, and you are tired of fighting it, and you have grown weary, and you are battle fatigued. And yet, as he begins chapter 8, Paul is going to introduce us into what I'm calling a secret weapon. I'm not sure that's a good terminology, but I've used it for this reason. I want you to imagine or to visualize being in, literally, a battle. 
maybe much like the situation in Ukraine right now, and you are facing an opponent that's much larger and stronger than you, and yet the opponent who's larger and stronger does not know that you have a secret weapon. And when you use that secret weapon, everything changes. And, and now you begin to have the upper hand. And Paul is going to be talking, at least in the first 15 verses or so, of Romans chapter 8 about this secret weapon, which is God's Spirit. God's Spirit. And, and the Spirit of God is extremely real. And so we use a verse We've talked about a verse in the book of Acts for a long, long time. It's, it's in chapter 2. Most of you will have it memorized. It's in response to a question that people are asking because these people have come to the conclusion, the realization that they have been responsible for killing God's Son, killing Jesus. And they are overwhelmed with guilt. And they were overwhelmed with Maybe it's fear. What's going to happen to us now? And so in desperation, they cry out to the apostles, what can we do about it? What can we do? And so the response is made like this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have emphasized the first part of that verse, and rightfully so, a, a lot. That is that you and I, with this combination of repentance and baptism, enter the kingdom with the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. And while you use the verse over and over again, and while you quote the verse, and you may use that last sentence of the verse, at least during my lifetime, We've never really focused on it. We've never really talked much about it. Have you? Have you talked very much about it? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a gift. And these first 15 verses of Romans chapter 8, Paul is saying things like in verse 9, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. Now, the Spirit is every bit God. Remember how many times I've said, there is the God who is, and there is the God who came, and there is the God who stayed. The God who is is the Father, and the God who came is Jesus, and the God who stayed is the Spirit. We don't comprehend it very well, but it's all one God. And the God who came, the Spirit, is a gift. It's a gift to every one of us. And you may be asking the appropriate question, well, where is the Spirit? You say we have it as a gift. Where is it? And the remarkable answer is, it is in us. It is in us. The Spirit is inside of every one of us. And so you look at a verse like 1 Corinthians, and you look at chapter 6, and you're going to find that one verse, verse 19, and there are more verses in the New Testament, but this is a difficult lesson to be able to present in one little bit of time, but I want to call your attention to it. Paul asks us the question, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. He'll go ahead and say you've been bought with the price. And when you would use that word temple in that New Testament time, the mind would automatically seem to go back to that temple that was originally placed in Jerusalem, built by Solomon, designed by David, 
And it had to be exceedingly magnificent because it was the house where God was going to reside. Only in the New Testament, Paul says it doesn't work that way. God is not going to live in a house made of bricks and stones and that kind of thing. Where is God? Where is the Spirit? He said, it's right here inside of you. Now, isn't that remarkable? That you think literally that in the kingdom, we have God's spirit inside of us. It's even more remarkable than that. Because God's spirit is in us with power. It's in us with unusual power. I kind of feel like in days gone by, we may have been afraid to say that. But you realize how powerful Satan is, don't you? You realize how wicked he is with all of his schemes. You realize how exceedingly vulnerable we are to his schemes. And, and, and you, you already know by what I've already said, we, we get tired and we get weary of the battles. And Satan's using every one of those battles against us. And we grow weary. And yet we have this power within us, this unusual power within us. And it says in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, and there are other verses like this. But Paul is going to say to all of us, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the glorious riches of your inheritance in his holy people. And now watch this. And I want you to know, I want your eyes to be open. I want you to know he's incomparably great power to us who believe. You know what that power's like? It's like the mighty power that was used when Jesus was raised from the dead. And that power, he says, is in us. It's the power to, in one place you'll say, to overcome the strongholds of Satan. It's the power to fight Satan when he is working against you with all of his might. And nothing can stop God's power. And so when you're discouraged, when you're battle-weary, when troublesome times are here and our hearts are filled with fear, we have this power living within us to overcome Satan. And not only is this spirit, the spirit, in us with power, the spirit's in us with evidence or results or, you know how Paul uses the word, fruit. And I don't want you to think I'm just going to run through this little phrase in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I, I am going to speak of it, but I'm not just going to run through it. Because I want you to understand what he's really saying. I think what he's really saying. In the face of this context, the Spirit yields in your life, do you remember? Love and joy and peace. Well, now think about that for a moment. When I am weary, when I am fatigued, when I am tired of my battle. I don't do so well with the joy thing, naturally. Do you? And peace, the kind of peace that resides in your heart, where even though you're facing major surgery, there's a peace there. And even though you're facing some chemotherapy, there's a peace there. And even though you're facing whatever it is you're facing, and we're all facing something, because that's the way life works. Troublesome times are always here. And you're telling me that I can live with joy and peace and patience? And what about this? He talks about gentleness and kindness. The fruit is in us to build gentleness and kindness. I, I'm not the most gentle, nor am I the most kind person when I am weary and fatigued and aggravated with the battle. And faithful. You keep on 
and self-controlled. And I, I don't think Paul is in any way limiting the fruit of the Spirit to those words. I, I think the Spirit lives inside of us to give us wisdom. How to navigate in all these gray areas of life. And I will tell you, most of the areas of my life are gray. They're not black. They're not white. I'm trying to figure out what's the best step now to take. And the Spirit, I believe, lives in us to give us that ability to navigate. I want think about this. What would you say is required to have an abundant life? What is required to have an abundant life? Jesus said, I, I came that you might have a life and you might have it more abundantly. What, what is required for that? Because intuitively, deep down inside, I think that's what I want. And I suspect it's exactly what you want. Am, am I correct about that? We all want an abundant life. What is required to get it? Well, sometimes I have been led to believe that something new, some object in this world would bring it for me. And sometimes I've been led to believe that a vacation might do it. Or I've been to le led to believe that a certain moment of pleasure or certain indulgence might, might bring this abundant life. Only to now realize that none of that really works, does it? The abundant life can best be described as a life of love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness, regardless of circumstances. And that is what the Spirit of God wants to accomplish inside of every one of us. Now, do you see it? The Spirit is in us with power. The Spirit is in us to bring abundant life, even when everything is falling apart and everything's messed up. And, and, and so Paul's going to say, I, I'm going to tell you, if you're not living with the Spirit... If you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, you don't belong to Christ. And yet there are some warnings that come with it. There are some warnings that come to it, with it. Paul will speak to the people at Ephesus and also to the people at Thessalonica. And he'll tell them, I want you to be very careful with God's Spirit. Now, he'll use these two words. He'll say, I don't want you to hinder the Spirit, and I don't want you to quench or put out the Spirit's fire. I, I don't want you to do that. I, I think if Paul were speaking to us right now at this moment, I think he would say one other thing. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. So I think, I think in my lifetime, because we never talk about it. We never seem to acknowledge it. And my friends, it's not an it. The Spirit is not an it. The Spirit is a he. The Spirit is God. And so I've gone through life ignoring it. And if I ignore it, how can I expect it to work in my life? Him to work in my life. And then I think I can, I can talk in certain ways. And I, remember how we started Romans chapter 6? We try to live, so to speak, with one foot in the world and one foot over in the kingdom. And, and so we engage in things in this world and we start thinking like this world. And I can almost see the Spirit shrinking back and, and, and kind of closing His eyes and thinking, well, don't act like this. Don't do this. You remember when Paul will write to Timothy, 1 Timothy letter, 2 Timothy letter? I have said for years, and I still believe it to be true, that Timothy is battle fatigued. He's absolutely worn out. He's wanting to give up. There are a lot of reasons for it. He's young. He's sickly. He's not in good health. There are a lot of reasons for it. But in the second letter, Paul will write and he will say, Timothy, God didn't give you the spirit of timidity. He didn't give you a spirit to shrink back. He didn't give you a spirit to, to give up. 
He gave you a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. He seems to be saying to Timothy the same thing we've been talking about. Timothy, why would you be acting like this? Don't you know God's spirit is inside of you and it's powerful? And it lets you live an abundant life even in the midst of this? But you've got to pay attention to it. And so what he'll say is, you've got to fan it, fan it back into flame. You've got you to fan the spark so it's going again. You're, you're somehow living so you're hindering it and you're quenching it and, and the fire's dying out. Is, is that making sense to any of you? You and I came into the kingdom. And we came into the kingdom in warfare. Satan wants you. He wants you out of this building. He wants you away from anything related to Christ. He, and I'm telling you, he has a mighty hand right now. He has a mighty hand right now. I'm not even sure. This is going to sound way radical. I'm not even sure Susan and I can continue to keep a regular television in our house because I'm sick of the advertisements. Best I can do is record and skip them, but I'm sick of the advertisements. I'm sick of them trying to tell me suddenly that this over here is right and this over here is right when I know it's wrong. I'm tired of it. And I can't keep hindering and quenching God inside of me because God has a plan. Let me tell you something else. I'm kind of thinking now that there's a verse in the book of Luke, chapter 11, that says we need to ask for more. We need to keep asking. Look at what it says. It, it's, it's kind of that takeaway from the Sermon on the Mount, kind of repeat, but if then you, you fathers who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So I've been making it a habit for a long time almost every morning, to ask the Father, let me live in such a way today to not hinder your spirit. And I frequently ask, will you give me more of your spirit? And I sit up here on the front row every Sunday morning. I don't know if there's ever a Sunday morning that passes that I don't ask the Father to give the Spirit inside of me the power to help me form my words so that what he says in Scripture becomes meaningful to you. If you think me getting up here is about me, you've totally missed it. It's not about me. It's not about how I'm dressed. It's not about how I think I should deliver it. I ask every Sunday, please let your spirit guide my words. Give me the energy. I learned a long time ago that in public speaking, 50% of the success of a talk is not the content. It's how I do it. It's if, I, if I'm tired, if I'm tired, it doesn't go over well. Because there's an energy drain from me to you. Why do you think I dance around like this? I mean, the elders are wondering how to get music in here so I can do it a little more effectively. But why, why do you think I do that? Because I'm trying to pump energy into the audience. I want you to, to see it's too important. I ask God to help the Spirit let me do that. And sometimes I ask Jesus, will you please help me with this? And will you help the Spirit to help me with this? Because I'm not capable. But what would happen if you and I started living our lives, acknowledging that we are the temple of God? And what would happen if we started living our lives talking to God about how real that is? And what would happen then if we utilized the power and recognize the power. And what would happen if we recognize the abundant life? All because the Spirit lives inside of us. Wouldn't life be better for all of us? For those of us here in the building, for those who are listening at a distance? That's what God wants. 
We're going to take our communion and we're going to remember that God gave us his son. God gave us the ability to have our sins wiped away. He gave us the ability to live in his family, literally his family, his kingdom. But God didn't stop there. Now, here's the amazing part. He didn't stop there. He didn't throw you into the kingdom and just walk away from you. He's going to make sure that you and I are equipped to live this life as hard as this life is. And the greatest equipping he ever has done is to put his spirit inside of us. And so as we're thankful this morning for Jesus, let's be thankful that he doesn't want us to be lost again into Satan. He, he, he wants us to be fortified. He wants us to realize every moment of our lives, we are living with God inside of us. So think about that as we take these emblems. Let us pray. Lord Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the day. We want to thank you for this opportunity we have at this time to come around this table to remember the sacrifice that was made on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we prepare to break this bread that represents Christ's broken body on that cross, we pray we do so in a manner pleasing to you and beneficial to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear Father, again, we want to thank you for the sacrifice that was made on the cross for each of us that we have a hope of eternal life through that sacrifice. As we prepare to take this cup, which represents Christ's shed blood on that cross, we pray we do so in a manner pleasing to thee and beneficial to our souls. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Do you find it interesting that everywhere you turn in the New Testament, especially in the letters, it's the same message over and over again? And the basic premise of that message is that the writers are trying to convince us that life in the kingdom is the best life you can possibly live. Life in the kingdom is quality living in every way. And life in the kingdom yields eternal life in paradise. That, that, that's the thing that Paul was trying to write about when he writes about the Spirit. That's the thing Paul was writing about all the way through thus far the book of Romans. <coughs> he's urging. He's pleading. And as we move beyond chapter 8, which will take us a while to get through chapter 8, but when we move beyond that, you'll find he pleads even more strongly that we would be a part of the kingdom and we would celebrate continually being a part of the kingdom. So if he pleads like that, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we really openly invite people into the kingdom and invite people to live in the kingdom by the design of God and by the spirit of God who lives inside of us, with whom we walk, day by day, through the course of our lives. That's what we try to do every week. We just invite you to be a part of the kingdom. So let's stand and sing with that invitation. Beyond this land of heart, England, England, living, are beyond the losses, are cunning this, and are beyond the day. Beyond the sorrow.
thank you, Father, for this day. We're thankful for the many, many blessings that you continue to bless us with, more than we deserve, and we just cannot thank you enough, Father. We're thankful for this day that we could gather here. We're thankful for Ken and his ability to deliver a message, and we just continue to pray for Ken and the elders and the work that they do here. Be there for them as they may need guidance from time to time. Continue to bless them as only you can. We're so thankful, Father, that we can talk to you as our Father, that we have concerns and we know that you will take care of them as you see fit, Father. And we have many who are hurting, who are in need of comfort, some having surgeries, some, you know the situation better than we do. We just pray, Father, that you'll take care of that situation. Give them the comfort they so desperately need. We continue, Father, to pray for Ukraine, for the world, for, for peace, uh, just pray, Father, that the leaders of this world will find guidance in your word, Father. Continue to be with us as we depart this place. May we continue to walk in the Spirit. May we always be the example you would want us to be. Continue to strengthen us, Father, we're weak. Forgive us when we fail you and always be with those less fortunate. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.